Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Both a celebration and exploration of St. Louis architecture. Recognizing it and addressing it early on is going to be very, very important. A reminder that Jewish life was vibrant and diverse. Today on Spotlight, why the Missouri History Museum is allowing you to color on the walls. How this exhibit honors St. Louis architecture. Plus, a local researcher discovers COVID-19 increases mental health risks up to a year after infection. And then a writer and activist who fights for injustice with energy and eloquence. But first, the St. Louis Holocaust Museum gets a renovation. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. standing right in front of right now at the St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum. And this is going to be a place where people can enter and learn the chronology of the Holocaust, learn the lessons through the voices of St. Louis survivors, St. Louis liberators, and witnesses to the Holocaust. We had a beautiful museum that was around for 25 years that served thousands of people each year, and we're really proud of it, and we're still really proud of it. Uh, but it was time for a bit of a facelift. So the new museum will be about 36,000 square feet. The old museum, the entire facility, including offices and theater, was a little less than 8,000. And so the entire facility we're standing in right here um, is four times the size. We made a conscious decision to make sure that the voices of St. Louis Holocaust survivors are telling their story. So as you're going through the museum, and you can actually see some quotes behind me here, You'll see quotes, you'll see photos, you'll see artifacts from St. Louis Holocaust survivors, some liberators and some witnesses throughout the museum. So it's really them telling their own story. We have a beginning and end film. The beginning film is actually will be in this room right here. Uh, the beginning film will talk about Jewish lives before the Holocaust. You'll see family celebrations, you'll see bar and bat mitzvahs, and actually you'll see a companion film at the end where you'll see a, a video that's, that's really kind of about the purpose of this museum. You'll see again videos and photos of St. Louis survivors living their lives. As we know, anti-Semitism did not begin with the Holocaust, nor did it end with Holocaust. These walls will be filled with uh, family photos, vacation photos of Jewish families uh, before the Holocaust, most of whom actually, most if not all of whom, were either St. Louis survivors or their families. Uh, there'll be artifacts that are, that are lit up, and then when you swipe your hand over the little sensor, uh, you'll hear the voice of a survivor. And it's a reminder that Jewish life was vibrant and diverse and cultured and looked a lot different in a lot different places before the Holocaust. The St. Louis Kaplan Feldman Holocaust Museum will open to the public on November 2nd. Visit stlholocaustmuseum.org. To learn more from Holocaust survivors as they share their stories, visit our educational website, educate.today. Use the keyword Holocaust. Looking for St. Louis-centric videos to use in your classroom? Check out our educational resources at educate.today. We are standing in the Coloring STL exhibit at the Missouri History Museum that is both a celebration and exploration of St. Louis architecture in all of its shapes, sizes, and styles. Leaning into the creativity and exploration of architecture, we wanted visitors to be able to explore some of their own creativity. So we decided to do a brand new exhibit unlike anything we've tried before. Behind me on the walls here, you can see more than 50 dry erase colorable illustrations of local St. Louis structures. We've got everything from the nationally known landmarks like Union Station and the Fox Theater, down to the very home St. Louisans live in. We want visitors to come fill these with the wildest variety of color their minds can dream up. And we invite them to come bring their family and friends and scribble on the walls of a history museum. How often do you get to say that you've scribbled on the walls at a history museum? Obviously, coloring in the walls is a huge draw. See what I did there? Uh, 
but visitors are going to see so much more than just the coloring on the walls in this gallery. We have more than 60 artifacts from real St. Louis structures, ranging from the 1850s historic St. Louis Riverfront, all the way up to 1960s mid-century modern shopping malls that once stood in St. Louis. In addition to that, we have a historic image theater with more than 50 views of images of historic St. Louis streetscapes and buildings. We even have touchable, real historic building materials. People will be able to feel real bricks made right here in St. Louis, feel the difference between them all and how these bricks were used for different things, and learn about how the city's look came from right beneath our feet. So it's not just the coloring on the walls. No matter what avenue into architecture you're interested in, you'll find something here that speaks to you. So when we were thinking up the idea for the Coloring STL exhibit, you know, we knew architecture would be a huge hit. Anyone who's spent any time driving around St. Louis has seen stunning architecture that, you know, brings up all these questions in their mind about why these buildings are here. But we didn't just want to put some photos of buildings up on the walls. That wouldn't do it justice, sort of the sense of wonder that architecture can convey. So we decided to try something brand new. This is something very few history museums have ever done on a scale like this. Just getting these illustrations completed was an immense undertaking. Uh, these were all done by a local artist named Rory. She spent 14 months creating the more than 50 colorable structures you see on the walls behind me. Sharing some stories back and forth with her, this was a task unlike any she had ever done in her life. Uh, she talked about how difficult it was, especially on some of these historic buildings that no longer stand. You had to use historic photos to recreate very precise details. But I think she did an incredible job. And one of the fun parts of getting up close to these buildings is you start to notice details you've never seen before. Even I, as a historian of St. Louis architecture, am noticing new details on these structures I had never noticed before. So it's a really fun way to interact with artwork, again, that few history museums have tried on a scale like this. But we knew this was an important way to sort of drive that history home in a deeper way. This is about building connections to the community around you. We want people to bring their family and friends and spark up conversations about these buildings while they're coloring them. You know, parents sharing with their children what kind of home they grew up in, or newcomers to St. Louis ending up sparking a conversation with lifelong residents about these buildings. So it really is more about building that deeper sense of community, all while having fun coloring on the walls. Coloring STL will be open from August 20th, 2022, all the way till May of 2024. So you have all of next year to come see this incredible gallery. You can come back time and time again, color a new building every time you come, bring your friends and family. We just really want people to fill this space with imagination and life. And best of all, the price is right. It is absolutely free. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Previously on Spotlight, we looked at the possible cardiovascular effects of COVID-19. This week, we look at the mental health risks associated with long COVID. From the start of the pandemic, COVID-19 infections had mysterious twists and turns. They were healthy before they got COVID-19, telling us that weeks after the initial infection, they were still having lingering problems in the form of brain fog or fatigue and all sorts of different symptoms. During this time, people experience varying degrees of uncertainty, isolation, and mental health challenges. It was a lot to take in. But Dr. Ziad Al-Ali was paying close attention. To their credit, this patient community, they called themselves long, long callers and started to refer to the syndrome or the entity as long COVID. Al Ali is a clinical epidemiologist at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and he's the chief of research and development at the Veterans Affairs St. Louis Healthcare System. When people felt helpless, Al Ali became committed to finding answers. And we committed right there and then to try to understand, to do our best to try to understand what's going on. Al Ali conducted extensive studies on long COVID. He's focused on a variety of symptoms affecting different parts of the body. One of the concerns rising to the top of the list, mental health. We knew that, that all of us during this pandemic experienced some sort of stress, right? But what we didn't know, do people with COVID-19 have it worse? So we did this study to evaluate the risk of mental health problems in people with COVID-19 versus control groups who did not get COVID-19. For the study, Al-Ali and his colleagues analyzed the de-identified medical records in the vast database maintained by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. The database covered the months of March 2020 through January 2021, before the widely available vaccinations. 
But Dr. Al Ali helped to prove in another study that vaccinations reduce the chances for long COVID by 15 percent. So long COVID is still a problem for the vaccinated. The study about the mental health risk from having a COVID-19 infection involved more than 150,000 people with COVID-19 from that vast database. Compared to the control groups that are together more than 10 million people. What we found are people with COVID-19 had increased risks of mental health disorders, including anxiety, depression, stress and adjustment disorders, sleep problems. You know, some of them were needing to be initiated on sleep medications, antidepressants, anxiolytics, et cetera, et cetera. Researchers discovered increasing chances of suicidal thoughts and substance use disorders. The study found that mental health disorders occurred within one year after recovery from COVID-19 infections, even when people had infections with asymptomatic or only mild symptoms. People who got COVID-19 survived the first 30 days. When we followed them for a year later, they manifested with higher risk of mental health problems than people who did not have COVID-19. Overall, the study found that people who had COVID-19 were 60 percent more likely to suffer from mental health problems than those who were not infected. It's very, very clear that people with COVID-19 have increased risk of a variety of neurologic problems and neuropsychiatric problems. That could be explained by the, the virus itself through uh, inducing some potentially structural changes in the brain or other neurologic alterations that might then lead to the higher risk of neurologic consequences and psychiatric consequences. The next step for Dr. Al Ali is to study long COVID conditions after infection from COVID-19 variants. Dressing it at this point and nipping it in the bud is going to be the best approach rather than sort of letting it cascade down until it becomes a much, much more serious problem down the road. And attention to it, recognizing it and addressing it early on is going to be very, very important. It's to be anticipated that a public figure must, at some point, confront the contradictory nature of widespread admiration and condemnation. This is especially true when exposing the duplicitous nature of institutions and government powers. This is familiar territory for writer and activist Arundhati Roy, as is evident in her books and essays, including 1997's Booker Prize-winning novel, The God of Small Things, Roy has a remarkable talent for laying bare the inner workings of systems of injustice within socio-political structures. To understand an issue and reveal it to an audience with such rage, energy, passion, and eloquence is in part what makes Roy so significant in the political and literary spheres. While criticized and threatened by many of India's right-leaning, she is simultaneously revered in India and across the globe for her intellectual honesty and alertness to fascism, racism, classism, war, nuclear weaponry, the caste system, environmental destruction, religious discrimination and violence, and so much more. Which is why it's so well deserved that she's being honored with the 2022 St. Louis Literary Award. While visiting St. Louis to receive the award and take part in the ceremony in her honor, I had the privilege of sitting down with her and discussing her journey and experience as a writer of such esteem. Congratulations, Arundhati Roy. I'm wondering if you ever take a step back and look at all the work that you've done and uh, the impact that you've had. You know, I've never been a, a person who wants to be sort of introduced by the awards I've won. But sometimes for us, for people like me, living in the space that I live in and the time that I live in, an award is also a protection of a kind, you know. So um, it's, it's a very uh, complicated river that I swim in. Uh, and uh, so the, the body of work is something that is not something that one looks back and, and necessarily to feel good about oneself, you know, but it all informs what you do next and uh, how you do it and what is the next layer that you add to it. And uh, it's about 
it really it's about understanding the world I live in. You're known in part for your ability to be blunt and confrontational and to say things that need to be said. But are you ever, or have you ever been hesitant or, or fearful before coming out with, with, with a truth? I think a lot before I say the things I say because every sentence, every comma, every semicolon, every pause is examined and fired upon and argued over. So in this moment in India where there's so much danger, so much danger, all my friends, I mean so many of my friends are in jail. Even when I'm here, I'm reading about another friend being arrested and you know, so I can never be a fan of being uncertain or being confident. One has to think very carefully about saying things and then you can say them with confidence once you've thought it through, you know. But um, I love uncertainty, you know, I love uh, ambiguity. It's not that I have some a uh, sledgehammer with which I uh, want to come down on things. So even the things that I say with certainty will be said after having taken into account the complexities, the uncertainties, the ambiguities. Because sometimes having taken those things into account, you still must pick a side, you know? Otherwise you are cowardly. To find out why she says finding humor has helped her fight tough battles, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hecmedia.org. We are currently in the Angad Arts Hotel on the first floor gallery in the Grand Center Arts District. Our quarterly exhibit is It Appeared Out of Plain Air with Andrea Badner and Jody Mauer. The work on display is all plain air paintings and drawings. Plain air actually comes from the French in plain air, which means in open air. So the artists take their canvas outside and that's where they create these works. Here at Angat Arts Hotel, we take a lot of pride in having local artists on exhibit. So both Jody Maurer and Andrea Badner are both local from within 200 miles. In these particular pieces, Andrea Badner is working on paper, and a lot of her works is mixed media. So there's some oil pastel, watercolor, graphite. She generally takes her works literally on the road with her. In this particular show, she took a cross-country trip through Flagstaff, Arizona, and many other places in Arizona, and to the Cayman Islands. So there's a little bit of beach vibe. And Jody Maurer, originally from St. Louis, all of her works are in oil, mostly on canvas and panel. A lot of hers have a very woodland feeling, so we're pastoral, and there's a lot of texture to her work. So with hers, the oil paintings are very, very chunky. She just palette knifes it right onto the canvas, which gives it this very textural surface. And that kind of adds a little of the ambiance of the scene you're seeing as well. Here at Angad Arts Hotel, uh, Angad is actually named after Angad Paul, one of our founders. And one of the things that we really use as a mantra here at the hotel are Angad's personal quotes what is art but seeing the world in a different way, and what is life but a series of experiences connected together. So in this particular exhibit, it is exciting to see the world from someone else's perspective and kind of experience it through their canvas or the paper or what medium they're using. And also to kind of imagine you're traveling through these works with Andrea and Jody. All of the works here at Angad Art Hotel are by local artists and are for purchase. If you'd like to learn more, you can see us at the website at www.angadartshotel.com or come through and see our exhibit. It appeared out of plain air, open through the end of November. St. Louis's close relationship with an area in China later on Spotlight. This is not the school music group you might remember as a child. It's not band class or orchestra. 
It's more like an improv night with friends, with both movement and music. We play all sorts of music, and it's not just one genre, and it lets us try out new things. And we get to do choreography, which is so much fun to dance around and play music. It's just such an experience. I really love it so much, and so it's such an interactive way of performing. Meet the Lindbergh High School Strolling Strings, a high-energy group of musicians with an alternative style of playing strings and other instruments. I was a member and president of Strolling Strings. It was my whole life. I loved it, and it really sparked a passion for music when I was there. Tara Landers directs the group composed of student musicians who audition for coveted spots. There is a lot of laughter with the group and a shared love of music. The music that we play is, to me, really interesting because we'll go from rock to super old, like, Irish music to fiddle music, and we play so many different kinds of music that you really learn to have a, a more di diverse sense of the art. We are basically a, an amateur slash professional <laughs> group because we do um, have a fee that we suggest for performances and that allows us to um, buy new equipment. It's, you know, we have a whole sound system, uh, speakers and microphones and wireless body packs and et cetera. And it also helps us to travel. The group is a registered 501c3. The strings also do community outreach performing for local charities. Since it's an extracurricular, the kids spend a lot of their free time rehearsing, performing, and socializing with the group. It, it's a really close-knit group of people. It's really great. And also the fact that we play for so many different things. We play for events in our community, like the Suncrest Festival. We, we also play at like nursing homes, which has been really fun. We also play at really, really cool places, like the Red and Blue Gala. Senior Benny Maurer says being part of the Strolling Strings has changed him as a musician. My freshman year, I wasn't as um, quick in improv improvisation, uh, but now I can think on my feet more quickly. I can, uh, I'm a better problem solver, and I can uh, just be a better musician. Maurer plans to study music composition at Webster University, now that his one-time hobby turned into a passion through his involvement with the group. I feel like that the connections I made in Strolling Strings are going to have a big effect on how I make music because now I have just so many people just ready to jump on any opportunity to help me compose and help me write and help me perform music. The group has traveled nationally and internationally and has been recognized with awards for their work. But students say it's the friendships and life lessons that make strolling strings life-changing. I think that the biggest thing is, is having confidence. I think that the first thing that you learn in strolling and something that applies to everything later in life is the, the confidence in just being able to try new things and under a stressful environment. And at first you're really scared to play in front of other people and it's really stressful, but eventually like, you, just, you just enjoy it and you, you kind of thrive in that environment. And I think the biggest thing is just enjoy yourself, don't stress out too much, just be willing to do new things. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. In August of this year, a bronze statue of a Chinese batter was unveiled at Bush Stadium. The batter is awaiting a pitch from a statue of St. Louis Cardinal Adam Wainwright, located 7,000 miles away in Nanjing Hexi Urban Eco Park. These statues celebrate the 40 plus year friendship between St. Louis and Nanjing, who formed the first Sino-American sister city relationship in 1979. Mama, is he playing now 
Nanjing and Saint Louis became sister cities in 1979. In the past four decades, ties between the two cities have grown ever closer. In 2019, Jingling Library and St. Louis County Library exchanged books as gifts, which draw closer people's hearts and minds and built a bridge for mutual understanding. Cooperation and exchanges have been ongoing between Nanjing Drum Tower Hospital and BJC, as well as Washington University in St. Louis, which I hope will bring more benefits to our citizens. These two leaf trees were jointly cultivated by Nanjing and St. Louis more than 40 years ago. Now. They are thriving by Grand Lake, just like the friendship between two cities. Next week, the story of Patience Worth, a spirit channeled by a St. Louis housewife through a Ouija board. Plus, a local artist works on the movie Box Trolls. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.